I'm here with comedian Rod Placco. We're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna go over this video that explains kind of all the stuff that's been going wrong, not only in England, but you can extrapolate it out to the economy of Western democracies, especially in the United States. So, Mark Blythe, this guy, Mark Blythe, is that? Here he is. I'll, I'll show you who he is. That guy, Mark Blythe. He's a uh, he's a political scientist from Scotland, who's a professor at uh, Brown University. And uh, I was—I don't know how I came across this uh, video, but this guy starts talking sense, like everything I've been thinking about, and, and uh, he's saying. So uh, he has some great ideas about the euro. I'm going to play it. We'll stop and start it. Here's what he says right off the top. Now, this has everything to do with Brexit, okay? so Here's let's... the thing. My, my side is I'm very pro-European, but I'm against the euro. So if I still lived in the United Kingdom, I would have an interesting choice. So if you look at Larry Elliott and The Guardian, Larry has, uh, has said that uh, he thinks he should vote for exit because this might be the existential crisis that blows up the euro. Now, why would you want to blow up the euro? Because that will be terrible, et cetera, et cetera. Because the long run effect of the euro is going to be to drive Western European wages down to Eastern European levels in global competition for export share with the Chinese. That's one interpretation as to where this all goes. And that's going to be fine for the Eastern Europeans coming up. It's going to be great for very efficient exporters in the North. It's going to be absolute disaster for France parts of Italy, if not all of Italy, and certainly for Greece. So I don't know if you understand what he's saying. What he's saying is he's there's some people saying that not only should we get, uh, we should blow up the euro. Why? Why do you want to get rid of the euro? And he's saying, well, what do you think is going to happen? So you have low-wage Eastern Europeans workers and higher-wage Western European workers. So what do you think is going to happen with one central governing economic body that doesn't give a shit about the workers? Do you think they're going to try and raise the wages of the Eastern Europeans, or they're going to try and bring them down so they can all compete with China? That's what's going to happen. So that's what he's saying. He's like, he's, I'm not a Fed. That there's a, there's a great argument to be made for getting rid of the euro. Because now what they're going to try and do is try to suppress every worker's wage in the European Union so they can now compete with China. So it's this race to the bottom. And if you have sovereignty over your own economy as a country, you maybe have more control over that stuff. That's a, that, I, that's a pretty good idea. I like that idea because what's been happening and, and that's I mean, look what they did. Look what the European Union did to Greece. And he's just making the case that, that same shit's going to happen to Italy. They're going to happen. I'm telling you. I'm, uh, this Brexit, not that bad of a thing for working people. Let's go. There's more. He's got a lot more to say. Now, if you have a system in which one side's running a surplus and the other side isn't allowed to run a deficit because of the rules, the only thing the other side can do is permanently contract their economies to allow someone else to make money selling BMWs. I don't see that ending well. So perhaps it's better to nip it in the bud when you've got the chance. So he's saying, he's saying correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an economist. Uh, but he's saying, you know, if uh, there's a country inside the European Union running a surplus, well, another country isn't. A, so when you're in bad economic times, you run deficits. That's how you get out. That That's what we did. You run deficits. You deficit spend. You stimulate your economy. Well, if you're all in this one big economic European Union, individual countries won't be, won't be allowed to do that stuff. So the only way they can get out of bad economic times is to contract, meaning austerity, which, as we know, doesn't work and only hurts people. It only helps the banks, which is why they're okay with it. And he's saying that's a bad thing. I don't see that ending well when individual countries inside of the Euro European Union aren't allowed to run their own deficits. That's what he's saying, right, Ron? Yeah, wrong. yeah. That's, okay. And, Have, and, and I see, like, the kind of foresight that he has there, and that that's sort of I, – I had not thought of it from that perspective before, but that does make a lot of sense. And as somebody that has a lot of family over in Italy, uh, despite my uh, ginger appearance, I do have a lot of family over in Italy. Placone is an Italian name. Uh, I, I kind of see that perspective, and that, and that that makes a lot of sense, what he's saying. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense, right? He's got more to say. Let's, let's listen. Now, the thing is with Brexit, I don't think that's what the debate's all about. This is Trumpism. Everybody's got a version of it. Trumpism. Trumpism. Remember Donald Trump? Yeah. Right, okay. So well, here's what I mean by Trumpism. For the past 25 years, particularly the center left, has told the bottom 60% of the, of the income distribution in the country the following story. 
Globalization is good for you. It's awesome. It's really great. And we're going to sign these trade agreements. Don't worry, there'll be compensation. It'll be fine. You'll all end up as computer programmers. It'll be fantastic, right? And by the way, we don't really care because we're all going to move to the middle because that's where the voters are. And they're the people with money. And they're the ones that we really care about. So you get the shift under Schroeder. You get the same thing under Blair to New Labour, whatever. And you make that move. And you basically take the bottom 30% of the income distribution and say, we don't care what happens to you. And that is what's happened in the United States also. Neoliberals have turned their back on workers. They got in bed with Wall Street and corporations just like the Republicans. And now we have things like NAFTA and the TPP deal and no unions anymore. And we have the biggest income disparity since the Gilded Age. 50% of all wage earners in America earn less than $30,000. So that's the result of that. So it's happening there. It's happening here, too. So that's what he's pointing out. Yeah, there's been heavy frustration uh, with new labor over there that, that I think really spiked a lot when Iraq happened. And then, and then I think this is just all that coming so new, to a total head. So you mean when new labor, you mean, so there's the labor party, which Jeremy Corbyn now is the head of, but mm -hmm. he's a real lefty. Now new, but he's a, so that's labor, but new labor would be Blair. Mm -hmm. That would be like the, the, uh, Hillary Clinton wing of the party. Right. right? So that would be the neoliberal, the new labor would be neoliberalism. Right. Yes. And then Jeremy Corbyn, he would be the Bernie Sanders, the real liberal. Right. And yeah, when I said frustration, I was, yeah. I was referring to the progressives over there. So the progressives over there are, for, are you're saying, and because new labor, Tony, but back the Iraq war, right. Which is. You know, we're not supposed to be warmongers if you're a liberal. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's it's one of the rules. Yeah. So you're talking about so a lot of people on the left got uh, disaffected from the leadership, their leadership in the Labor Party, the new labor, starting with the Iraq war. Big time. I think that was when it took a, a very big shift to the right that angered a lot of people. And it, it probably predated that, too. But I think that was a big turning point. And then this was just another sharp turn that, that frustrated people further. That was the first thing I thought of when it, when it all started going down. Uh, here, he's got more to say. You're now something to be policed. You're now something to have uh, your behaviors change. We're going to nudge you into better patterns, as the Americans like to say. It's a very paternal, it's a very patronizing relationship. This is no longer the warm embrace of social democracy, arm in arm with so solidarity with the working classes. They're there to be policed and excluded in their housing estates so that you feel safe in your neighborhoods, so that you can have your private schools, there they have their public schools. Isn't this amazing? It's like exactly what's happened here. It sounds oddly familiar. It's oddly yeah, familiar. I so there's like... another. There's, there's the upper 10% has control of our economy and our government and meaning our culture and our complete society. They've screwed over everybody, all the workers. People keep working for less and less and less. Keep you're getting now if you want to go to college, that's the only way to get a decent living. Now, oh, we're gonna burden you with tens of thousands of dollars of debt just because you want to get an education and, and com contribute to our co So they're doing the same thing, the people over there, they're doing it here. And so now half the people in the country are ready to vote for Trump, and half of the Liberal Party are ready to not vote for Hillary Clinton. So there's a big problem. It's over there. It's over here, too. And guess what the elites are doing in both countries? Ignoring the problem again. But you know why? Because they would have to take responsibility for it. And they would have to change. And they would have to do things like work job, a job program. And they'd have to regulate Wall Street. And they'd have to stop shit like TPP. And that ain't never going to happen. Because it's a one big gravy train, one party rule, and it's the money party. And this is amazing. This is mind-blowing, this guy's saying this stuff. Yeah, I, I do love the subtle sarcasm, by the way. Like uh, earlier in the clip, we should point that out. They're like, Donald Trump, perhaps you've heard of him. Perhaps yeah, I've heard, I've heard of him. I've <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> heard the name. I've heard him. You don't really want to pay taxes for it anymore. So once this has evolved over 20 years, you have this revolt, not just against Brexit. It's not about the EU. It's about the elites. It's about the 1%. It's about the fact that your parties that were meant to serve your interests have sold you down the river. Uh, yeah, maybe they're all the same. The the, think how ridiculous this is. Think of the Scottish independence thing, right? So these guys vote to stay in because the entire British establishment links arm in arm and says, don't do it. And you've got to wonder why, because ultimately who's going to get hurt if they do it? People with money. So they're saying, don't do this, right? So, we, okay, they go, all right, then we won't do it, right? So then this, the SNP, the anti-austerity party, are in there like, I well, we didn't win that, but, you know, we're still in power, great, on you go. Okay, so what happens next? Well, if apparently if there's going to be a Brexit vote to get out, then the Scots are going to vote to get back in. Okay, this is fun, right? So you're going to give up George Osborne, who's an austerity chancellor, for who? 
Dr. Schaubler. So your nice little Scottish welfare state is going to be really well protected by the tender embrace of the Germans. So what he's explaining is that Scotland had a vote recently whether to leave the UK or stay in the UK. And they they voted to stay in the UK. Right. So now there's a vote to, to stay in the East, the European Union or leave it. Yeah. Donald and, Trump had a few misunderstandings yes. there. Right. He, he got some heat on Twitter. Yeah. And so that so all the party leaders said we should stay, stay in the union because, you know, money, right? So now that England's voted to get out, they're saying, hey, maybe we should take another vote to get in. And so this guy's making the point, really? You want to have your economy ruled not by the not by the people in London, but by the people in Brussels? That's what he said. So who do you think's going to give a shit more about? So there, it's a lose-lose for these guys. So this idea that Scotland's going to leave the UK and then join the European Union as some kind of uh, savior to their economy, he's saying that's a fool's errand. He goes, so, because who are you going to put in charge of your economy? The people who just screwed over Greece. They don't care about workers. Hey, I bet he even says that. How's that working out for the Greeks? Not really, not really. Right. People aren't thinking this one through. This is basically a revolt against technocracy. It is a revolt against governance by unrepresented, unelected, undemocratic elites. And having had a government where every single district in your country says no chance, 61% say no chance, and then the result is we're going to do it anyway, you're basically proving to people that democracy is irrelevant. So this is global Trumpism. And at the end, it's a no-win scenario. I mean. Well, it's a no-win scenario until basically elites figure out that at the end of the day, as I like to say to my American hedge fund friends, the Hamptons is not a defensible position. The Hamptons are a very rich area on Long Island that lie on low-lying beaches. Very hard to defend a low-lying beach. Eventually, people will come for you. <laughs> I love that. Eventually, people will come for you. That's my horrible Scottish accent, but... Uh... I love that idea that eventually people were, and it's starting to happen. That's why people are like, oh, those people, they're so crazy in the U. They would vote to screw over their economy. No, they're voting against unelected people running their lives. That's what that is. And by the way, now uh, all the MPs in the Labor Party voted to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. And Jeremy Corbyn ain't going anywhere because he said, you guys didn't elect me. The people elected me. Again, it's all this, undem and democracy is a real pain in the ass to elites. And in, on both sides of the pond, democracy really pisses them off because that look at what happened with Brexit. And now they're saying they're going to try to find a way to not do Brexit. Is there could there be a, a, a bigger thumb in the eye of, de, of democracy or voting of of the will of the people? They just voted to get out. Yeah, it's uh, I, I enjoy his summary, too. I mean, besides, as you kind of uh, hinted to it, having an absolutely lovely voice that makes me want to revisit every episode of Game of Thrones, he put it in a way, you know, sometimes you hear uh, you said he's an economist, right? Yeah, he, he's a, I mean, sometimes you hear a, a economists speak and, and it's reduced. Everything's just reduced. Uh, to widgets, and the, right. they pretend as if greed isn't a thing. Uh, but when you actually unpack something the way this guy did, you see uh, the full picture, and you see, okay, these are the issues we're dealing with. These are the factors involved. And then here's the peek under the hood as to what it really is, which is an undemocratic thing uh, fueled by the elites, which, as we pointed out, sounds eerily familiar. Sounds eerily familiar. Eerily familiar. So there you go. So that's what's really happening. That's what's really going on. That's what's really uh, in people's minds and hearts. And we've explained it before in other videos on this channel that it's an economic insecurity and being lied to by your leaders on every party, by the elites in your culture, that makes people vulnerable to demagogues who uh, peddle racism. That's what does it.